Hello with that and good afternoon ladies and gentlemen. Russia attacked Ukraine on the 24th of February, but its forces have now fully withdrawn from around the capital Kiev and northern Ukraine to Belarus and Russia. Russian officials have said that the focus of their forces is now the complete liberation of the Donbass, which broadly refers to Ukraine's eastern regions of Donetsk and Luhansk, where Russian-backed separatists held significant territory before this military operation. Today's updates pushed us to ask several questions. Why did Russia move toward the capital at first? Why their main goal was the Donbass region from the very beginning? And how will Ukraine fight in the eastern parts of the country, where districts over there are mostly pro-Russians? Numerous questions are directed to our panel of guests. We have Mr. Sebastian Perimony, member of Solidarity and Progress Political Party from France, and Don McLean Jail from Philippines, a geopolitical analyst in the Pacific region. Gentlemen, thank you so much for joining us in this debate. The show begins right after this break. And before we delve into discussion, let me invite you to follow this report. Russia on Tuesday called on the entire Ukrainian army to lay down their arms, uh, the last defenders of Mariupol, to end their senseless resistance. A call that comes as Moscow seems to have launched what it calls a new phase of its military operation in Ukraine. In Mariupol, the only few Ukrainian soldiers are now asked to lay down their arms. The Russian forces, while they continue to take control of the city, have made an ultimatum to Ukraine soldiers to surrender and they will be safe. This is our call to the world. This could well be the last call of our lives. We may be living our last days, even our last hours. The enemy is ten times more numerous than us. It has the advantage in the air, in the artillery and in its ground forces. In terms of equipment and tanks, we defend only one element. The Azov Stall Factory, where in addition to military personnel, there are also civilians who are victims of this war. The Russian Defense Ministry says Russian forces are opening a humanitarian corridor for Ukrainian soldiers to leave Mariupol. We call on the official authorities in Kiev to be reasonable, to order the fighters to stop the senseless resistance and leave the epicenter of the resistance. The situation in the southern Ukrainian city is horrific. It will add another page to history books of how war can turn entire cities into nothing. And while civilians in the port city continue to hide in underground shelters, Kiev has announced that a preliminary agreement has been reached with Russia to evacuate nearly 6,000 civilians from Mariupol on Wednesday. I've been there all the time, until they threw me out. They said to leave and the building was about to blow up. And they threw us out. And so we left. Last week, more than a thousand Ukrainian soldiers surrendered in Mariupol, but several hundred others, according to pro Russian separatists, are still in the huge Azovstal factory. So, as it seems now, the focus on Mariupol and the eastern part. Mr. Sebastian, before initiating in depth analysis into the war, would you tell us first how would the current Russian Ukraine crisis affect the domestic political scene in France? and the presidential elections, and how it would affect, in general, Europe? First, as a French politician, I have to say that we will have uh, the election on Sunday, the presidential election on Sunday, but we will have a third round, you know, with what we call the legislative election in June. So uh, I have to announce that I am candidate uh, for this election uh, for the French living outside in North Africa and West Africa, which include Algeria. So it's a good news. So. I call upon the people who are listening to us uh, to mobilize around my candidacy. So what we will discuss today uh, can be discussed at the National Assembly uh, in June of this year. So of course that the Ukraine war has a lot, a big impact on the French presidential election, but 
what is crucial is not is not really this Ukraine issue, is more you know the event that we will have tonight with the big debate uh, against uh, between Macron and Marine Le Pen because we all know that last time Marine Le Pen lost this debate and lost the presidency. So now she said that she is ready to defeat Macron. We will have this debate tonight, and so we will see. It's up to France, uh, to the French population, to decide. But what is sure is, in terms of uh, the conflict in Ukraine or in Europe, it will be black or white, as the two candidates are totally opposed on this situation. First, you have Marine Le Pen. Uh, first, you have Macron, you know, who is totally pro-European -Euro Union, federalist, uh, pro-NATO, uh, going with the United States on this uh, uh, war on Ukraine. And you have Marine Le Pen on the other side, you know, who want to, to leave NATO, and she is more pro-Russian, in a sense, and want to discuss with Vladimir Putin to solve the issue. But I think it's clear that you, this presidential election will be key in, the, in Europe with the winners of this election, either it is Marine or Macron, because it will be a very important choice, and also for the war in Ukraine, as the two candidates have opposite view on this issue. So it is very important, and the debate tonight that uh, everybody can follow uh, on the French uh, national TV it's very, very important uh, for the, uh, the future of France, the future in Europe, and also the future of the Ukraine crisis. Mm -hmm. Perfectly, Andres. So thank you so much for this really important point. Mr. McLean, how can you explain this sudden move toward the eastern part of Ukraine? Has Russia failed or this was a premeditated scheme to weaken the Ukrainian army and focus on the main goal, in other words, the Donbass region? Uh, thank you so much for your question and thank you for having me. Now we have to understand the recalibration uh, of Russia is a definite result of the realities on the ground. It has it's it, it has suffered significant losses which we cannot hide, and at the same time the recalibration uh, seeks to double down uh, on its aim to liberate the Donbas region, which may serve as an alternative buffer. Uh, against uh, an expansion from NATO, and at the same time, the offensive um, from the south has been considerable, and it has achieved considerable progress uh, in cutting Ukraine's access to the Sea of Azov, uh, and of course, a major portion of the Black Sea, except areas of resistance such as Mariupol, uh, with intense fighting in some townships, for that matter. Now, uh, talking about Mariupol, uh, Russia has clearly outnumbered Ukrainian forces there, uh, despite facing uh, logistical setbacks. And the ceasefire, for that matter, is something that we can see uh, that Russia intends to use to maintain and preserve uh, its forces, uh, its use of force. Uh, however, we can see that Zelensky uh, may want uh, to let Russian forces bleed more. Uh, and this can be seen as it's as he says that he would not want uh, Ukrainian forces to fight uh, to back down as they would want to fight till the end. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is something that we have to take into consideration. Uh, however, as we can see, um, the Guardian report, for that matter, um, you know, the Ukrainian forces themselves are seeking for help. Uh, the Guardian report has effectively outlined this. And uh, we have to take these into consideration from a moral standpoint, uh, which the Ukrainian president seems to use often to gain support from the West. So really what we are facing is a recalibration of uh, military posturing uh, based on the changes on the realities on mm -hmm. the ground. Perfectly understood. All right, moving on in our discussion, let me highlight this piece of news. Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov said that Ukraine did not appreciate the goodwill just when the Russian forces were withdrawn from the outskirts of Kiev. Lavrov stressed that the special operation in Ukraine aims to liberate the Donetsk and Luhansk people's republics has now begun. It's a new phase, and let's start with that. Operation in the east of Ukraine uh, is uh, uh, aimed, as was announced from the very beginning, to fully liberate the Donetsk and Lugansk republics. And this operation uh, will, will continue. It is beginning, uh, I mean, another stage of this operation is beginning. Uh, and I'm sure this will be uh, a very important moment of this entire special operation. So Sebastian, coming back to you, how and based on what did the French president 
Emmanuel Macron gained the first round of election against the political rivals Marine Le Pen and Jean Mélenchon, although critics say uh, Macron, as the EU leader, could not manage to bring peaceful end into Ukraine's war or even successful negotiations. Yes. First of all, we have to say that Macron did not really win the first round of this uh, presidential election, because if you count the vote against him, not only for Marine Le Pen, but also for Jean-Luc Mélenchon, who was the, the left-wing opposition, it's more than 40% uh, against Emmanuel Macron. And I uh, want to remember that even uh, Marine Le Pen and Jean-Luc Mélenchon are to leave NATO. So we cannot say that Macron win the first round of this election. You have 60% of the French population who vote for candidates who want to leave NATO and not to be submit, you know, to this uh, um, uh, imperial policy of NATO war against Russia and China. So it's one point. And I don't think, uh, as we say in French, you know, a lot of people think that we, we, not, we don't change a president in time of, of war. So, of course, it plays in favor of Macron as we are at war now and say we, we cannot change the president during a war. So it's playing in favor of Macron, but it's not enough to say that he win the first round of the election. So uh, it's very important uh, what will be the, 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 the result of this election, uh, because uh, if France want to be heard in this conflict, because we have to be truthful, you know, for now Europe has, has nothing uh, uh, has, has realized nothing to succeed in this European conflict. I want to remember uh, what said, you know, Victoria Nolan during the Obama presidency when they were uh, bringing to power after, after the Maidan coup d'état, when they bring, bringing their friends, you know, with the neo-Nazi party uh, at the end of the Ukraine. She said, sorry for the familiar language, she said, fuck the EU, the EU. So exactly what is going on now. So the crisis in Ukraine is a crisis between the United States of America, NATO, which, which controls NATO, and Russia. And for now, the European Union is just following, you know, without any voice uh, saying that we have to leave NATO and have our own policy regarding the question of bringing peace to Europe and negotiate with Russia and Ukraine. Mm -hmm. Understood. Mr. McLean, how is and what current happening now in, uh, is kind of, uh, can we call it a leftover of the WW2, especially when Russia keeps saying that Ukraine's Nazism should be stopped? Right, thank you. And one, some may call it as a leftover of the Second World War. I personally feel uh, that it is more of a leftover of the Cold War merged with recent geopolitical realities, of course. Uh, we can see that there were immediate concerns since 1997 uh, between Yeltsin and Clinton uh, on the uh, enlargement of NATO. And in fact, in 2001, uh, President Putin himself uh, wanted to join NATO, and the request was acknowledged by NATO leadership as well. Uh, Russia fears since that particular moment of being excluded from the European security architecture. However, as we all know, uh, the role of spheres of influence and the geostrategic value of Europe uh, has complicated the situation further. As my respected uh, co-panelist has mentioned, it has become certain that it is between Russia, the U.S., and NATO. And key U.S. strategists uh, and thinkers, uh, such as Dr. Kissinger, Professor Mearsheimer, uh, have been talking about the current predicament several years ago. Uh, Russia's invasion, aggression towards a sovereign state like Ukraine, shows that the real politic nature uh, of the international system, such as that from the Cold War, has not vanquished uh, in contrast to what scholars and academics have said. Rather, it is getting stronger by the day. And a solution, of course, uh, must be crafted based on this knowledge uh, with this particular scenario in mind. Sorry to cut your train of thought, uh, Mr. McLean, but to share a point with Mr. Sebastian. Uh, in Asia, uh, which candidates probably they support uh, in the France presidency, uh, France, uh, the elections in, uh, in France? I mean, here in Africa, people may look for Mélenchon because he is very good with the, the 
the refugees and the people from uh, around all the continents. On the other side, they are not with Macron because he is an EU leader and with uh, uh, Marie Le Pen because she is kind of extremist. I mean, in Asia, uh, which uh, president they may support? You mean the African uh, population? Yes. Oh, it's difficult. They should support us, not Mélenchon or Macron or Marine Le Pen. Uh, anyway, because you, you talk about Mélenchon, take the case of Mélenchon, you know, he's also, we can say that he wants to take refugees, you know, he's very nice, he wants to, to open the borders, but he's not what African people are expecting, you know, uh, he's not against the France CFA, you know, this uh, colonial uh, currency that it is imposed since the Second World War. You have 14 countries in Africa still today under the uh, currency, the France CFA, controlled by France. And you know, these 14 countries in Africa, in West Africa, are in the 30 countries, the, the poorest in the world. So it means that this France CFA have maintained sin, since the Second World War, 14 countries of Africa, more than 200 million people under extreme poverty. That's the case today. And I never heard Mélenchon, nor Macron, neither Marine Le Pen, say that we have to stop this, uh, uh, let's say, uh, economist uh, slave, uh, slavery colonialism, you know. Uh, it's like, of, uh, yes, it's uh, economical uh, colonialism. So uh, I have not heard any candidate discuss about that. And so if we are sovereignists for France, we have to be sovereignists for also the other country of the world which is not the case of the candidate in France. So that's a big problem. And second point, you know, African country wants to develop. They want infrastructure, they want water, they want energy, they want everything we, we avoid them to have. So no, no candidate in France are proposing that except my candidacy. So I think it's worth to look at it and, uh, and uh, be sure that uh, what Africa is expecting uh, is the future of their continent. Perfectly understood. Africa is always looking for a better solution. At a meeting with the, the top military brass, Russia's Defense Minister Sergei Shogui has accused the US and other Western nations of supplying Ukraine with weapons so that it continue fighting until the last Ukrainian. The Russian army is fulfilling the tasks set by the commander-in-chief in the course of the special military operation. The plan to fully liberate the Donetsk and Lohansk People's Republics is being consistently implemented, and measures are being taken to establish a peaceful life. The Russian servicemen participating in the operation show courage and heroism in the fulfillment of their military duty. The United States and Western countries are doing everything to drag out this special military operation as much as possible. The growing supplies of foreign weapons clearly signal their intention to provoke the Kyiv regime to keep fighting until the last Ukrainian. Mr. McLean, is what Russian officials claim true, or this is just a justification of failure since they couldn't reach the capital Kyiv? And how could the U.S. manage to make uh, war, this war profitable for its interest? Right. So we have to understand that uh, the war in itself uh, is definitely uh, an area of profit uh, for um, uh, defense manufacturers. As we can see, uh, major manufacturers, for that matter, have been increasing their profits uh, because of this particular situation. However, we can also see that, of course, there are several um, complicated factors involved um, perhaps we could talk about the situation and the possibility of, uh, of uh, expanding uh, NATO membership to Finland and Sweden, for that matter, um, will also add further complications to the situation at hand. So we have to take these factors into consideration in order to create an objective analysis of what is really happening throughout the situation. Mm -hmm. Ukraine has received fighter jets and spare parts to strengthen its air force said Pentagon spokesman John Kirby, declining to specify the number of uh, the countries that provided the aircraft. Kirby also did not specify the type of aircraft supplied to the Ukrainian army, which had been asking for war plans for weeks, but he implied they were Russian-made aircraft. 
I would just say, without getting into uh, what other nations are providing, that they have received additional um, platforms and parts to be able to uh, to be able to increase their fleet size. They have received additional aircraft and air aircraft parts to help them, you know, get more more aircraft in the air. I, I would say we certainly have helped with the with the transshipment of some additional spare parts. Uh, that have helped with their aircraft needs, but we have not transported whole aircraft. I'm, uh, I'm careful not to detail battlefield tactics here because we're not on the ground. And so our visibility is, uh, quite frankly, somewhat limited. More weapons is clearly going to upset uh, Russia. Mr. Sebastian, how do you think this latter will react, I mean, Russia toward these weapons to uh, all ways to Ukraine? And how is Europe going to deal with Putin's demand to pay gas and Russian oil by rubles? You know, the only alternative we have today, we have to think of the future, you know. The only alternative to this war, you know, is internal cooperation. And we should not accept to have this conflict going on in Europe between NATO and Russia. Otherwise, it will be chaos for everybody. So no country will be able in the world today, no country will be able to, to be uh, independent or live, or live by itself. So uh, I think the good news in that, because maybe we can see a good news, is that this crisis will allow us to reorganize the world financial and monetary system which is, in any case, is in bankrupt in Europe, in the uh, Occidental world. So, and put an end to the hegemony of the dollar. So I think uh, we have seen the Indian and the Russian see, um, signing a deal, you know, to, to have an exchange in rubles. Uh, I think it's the future of the world monetary and financial system. But I think nobody will be able to survive alone uh, in terms of energy policy and gas and so on and so forth uh, independently with, without working with Russia today. So I think it's a big dilemma, but we have to see uh, the, the, the solution before and then fight for it. Mm -hmm. Mr. McLean, this war pushed all European countries toward the Asian countries for an alternative over the Russian gas and energy. And even Russia is creating an alliance with major powers over that, such as China, India. So to this point, do you think Asian countries will be uh, leading and leaning toward the Eastern Pole in what seems to be a new bipolar world order? Thank you so much for the question. And first, we have to underscore that we are entering, in fact, towards a multipolar order uh, because of the rising uh, powers, particularly in Asia as well. And uh, this is beyond the traditional perspective of the unipolar moment of American hegemony or the bipolar moment. In fact, there are significant uh, increases uh, when it comes to the hierarchy of power in the international system. Now, if we talk about uh, Asia, for that matter, Asian countries uh, have shown their po uh, political maturity and offer new potentials, uh, particularly for European countries who are facing uh, material decline. And we have to understand, uh, you talked about the Asian position vis-a-vis uh, -vis the uh, Ukraine-Russia war, but we have to look into uh, what has led to this particular uh, balanced approach. Now, economically speaking, uh, greater economic troubles for countries are faced uh, that are indebted to international financial institutions or part of the uh, Chinese debt trap, for that matter, we have seen in South Asia uh, with uh, Pakistan, with Sri Lanka ongoing. And the sanctions applied on Russia have significant impacts on them as well, uh, these developing countries uh, in Asia. Mm -hmm. And on top of that, uh, this has led to calls for self-reliance and potentially de-dollarization, uh, as my co-panelist has also mentioned. Understood. And if we look into the security architecture, of course, uh, just a uh, brief point, um, while many critics continue to label the response of Asian countries as weak, uh, particularly because most of them do not want to slap sanctions on Russia, we have to understand it objectively. Understanding, of mm -hmm. course, the region is important to know the ongoing predicaments that these countries face individually. Understood. In a meeting in the Russian capital, Moscow, the Russian President Vladimir Putin and Armenian Prime Minister Nikol Pashinyan hailed the process of normalizing relations between Turkey and Armenia. 
Turkey and Armenia have had no diplomatic or commercial relations for 30 years. Talks are the first attempt to restore links since 2009 peace occurs. The two leaders also expressed their support for the implementation of the agreement signed between Russia, Armenia and Azerbaijan. Mr. Sebastian, majority of politicians all over the world are assuming that Putin's career has been damaged as a president, whether he succeeded to reach his goals or not. In this military operation, but in the same line of thought, Putin is still showing more experience as a king of politics since he's about to solve one of the historic conflicts, Armenia and Turkey. How can you read this? Yes, first, I, I want to make a point. I totally agree with, uh, with what was saying by the other participants about uh, the, the will of the U.S. Uh, who wants this war to continue as long as it's possible, and especially the military uh, industrial complex. And I want to mention that you will have a big event, you know, in Madrid in June, which is called Global NATO 2030. And it's a very big event organized by NATO, which will become, as it say, uh, and it will be presented like this, uh, to, to oppose Russia and China threat in the 10 uh, next years. And NATO is, go is going global and saying that they will be the military forces of the world financial empire against Russia and China. So, of course, they want this war to continue as long as they can. So that's one point uh, I wanted to make for, for, the, for the image or the career of Putin. You know, it's, it's quite funny because, you know, of course, making war is never good for your image. But I think the return of Russian, uh, the Russian diplomacy in the world is, is crucial today. And it's very, very important, as we have seen in Syria, for example, to stop the regi regime change policy of the U.S. starting in 2001 against Afghanistan, against Iraq, against Syria, against Libya. And it has to stop. And the return of the Russian diplomacy in the middle of this fundamental issue for peace and war in the world is very important. So I think it was said also by the other participants, we are now in a multipolar world. So the end of the American hegemony is over. And Perfect. we have to think, uh, you know, like this. So I don't think that the career of Putin is damaged at all by what is going on in Ukraine uh, mm -hmm. today. Understood. Mr. McLean, do you agree or disagree with what Mr. Uh, Sebastian has just mentioned, saying that his career is not yet being damaged. He is doing great in the, the diplomacy field. Thank Two minutes you. left. And, and, yes, thank you. And in fact, I agree with Mr. Sebastian uh, on the points that he has made for this particular matter. Uh, because as we can see, going back to my point, if we look into the situation in uh, Southeast Asia and South Asia, uh, these countries are also wary of uh, putting all their eggs in one basket, considering that they have external and internal constraints. And if we look into other, per uh, other particular factors, public opinion, uh, many, in fact, in South Asia, Southeast Asia, and West Asia are also wary about the double standards, uh, particularly that we can see what is happening throughout the Middle East uh, because of Western involvement and, of course, in uh, uh, in Afghanistan recently happening, and uh, it is continuously ongoing uh, for that particular matter, and the destruction on human life is something that they are wary about. So these countries, particularly in Asia, are creating balanced steps in order to address the situation peacefully. They have advocated for peaceful negotiations, as this will be uh, a long-lasting solution rather than supplying more weapons at the expense of Ukrainian lives. And this will not only damage uh, the credibility of Ukraine, the mm -hmm. people of Ukraine, but it will also spill over throughout the world and it will be catastrophic. And so, yes, I do agree with uh, Mr. Sebastian on this. Quite understood. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for uh, being with us in the show. Mr. Uh, Sebastian, Mr. McLean, thank you so much for your presence. I really do appreciate it. To this end, ladies and gentlemen, we reach the point for this coverage. A special coverage will be held tomorrow. For now, have a blessed evening and bye-bye.